To the more or less official bio, Christopher Hitchens was born in Portsmouth, England in 1949, though he became an American citizen like seven weeks ago. In between, he's been a columnist at Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, Slate, and Free Inquiry. Additionally, he's an occasional contributor to other publications, including Slate, Granta, and The Wall Street Journal. With a political and personal vantage that's, let's just call it, aggressively defiant of binary characterization, it's easier to ask where his work has not appeared or might not be welcome. Recent books written or edited include 1995's The Missionary Position, Mother Teresa in Theory and Practice, 2000's No One Left to Lie to, The Values of the Worst Family, that same year's Unacknowledged Legislation, Writers in the Public Sphere, 2001's The Trial of Henry Kissinger, and Letters to a Young Contrarian, and 2002's Orwell's Victory. It's provocative stuff, especially the one about Mother Teresa. But none has met the standard set by God is not great, how religion poisons everything, which is why we've waited until this moment to have him on the town hall stage. That last bit is completely untrue, and we're extremely grateful he's here tonight to provoke us too, especially since until earlier today he was expecting a debate tonight with a partner who had to withdraw at the last minute. So please offer an extra warm welcome to Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, Ware, very much for that suspiciously terse introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, for coming. I'm going to take this, uh, a few ground rules, why not? I'm going to take your presence here, not as a compliment to my blue eyes and my sexual charisma, <laughs> though warm thanks to all those who were magnetized here by either of those but as a tribute to the importance of the subject, which I think has revived in a major way. Um, I take the view that people like yourselves come to events like this not just to listen, but to contribute and to engage. And so I'll, I'll be as brief as I dare be in my opening and then make myself your prisoner, as it were, or your guest, if you like. Um, and my ground rule is essentially that I don't want to have it said ever that I left with any question unanswered. Um, and I, I really do mean that sincerely. And I ask you only to bear in mind uh, the imminence of the cocktail hour. Um, okay. And I did think there would be someone else here, uh, as there has been everywhere else I've been on this tour, since we started in Little Rock about six months ago and went on a wonderful swing through Dixie, where I wish you could all have been there. Um, but... <laughs> and seen the pinched faces of the Baptists, uh, <laughs> the pinched and flabby faces of the faithful. Okay, so I'm going to have to question myself, which I've never done before, and is an act of, if, of what I call in the early stage of the book, um, solipsism. What do I mean by solipsism? Well, it's a good way into the argument, actually. Um, who here has a cat or a dog? Just, you may wonder why I'm asking you this. Surprisingly few people, but you've all run into dogs and cats. You're <laughs> Um, what is the world view of the cat? The world view of the cat... No, start with the dog. What's the world view of the dog? The dog is given by you food, shelter, water, love, affection, and it thinks you're God. The cat is given food, warmth, shelter, and love, by it thinks it's God. Religion makes the following appeal to us, which is why I say it poisons everything, because it goes to the, the, the deep nature of our self-respect and our humanity and our integrity. It makes the following bid to us. It says, you are born sinful. You're born guilty. You're guilty of crimes that were committed before you were born. You are not, not able to evade them. Your sin is original. You're made from dust, or in the Quran, from a clot of blood. Uh, your creator is not in a very good mood with you, and there's no reason why he should be, given what a uh, piece of excrement you basically are. <laughs> That's the masochistic element of it. Um, but after this thoroughgoing abjection, thoroughgoing demand that you throw aside all your self-respect, you're told there is, however, some redeeming news. 
The universe is designed with you in mind. The cosmos cares what happens to you. And if you will continue to abject yourself, like a serf, in front of God, uh, you may hope for the forgiveness of sins, uh, for eternal life, and for a divine plan. In other words, the maximum appeal to the abject, the servile in you, and the maximum appeal to the self-centered and the egomaniac. Not a very wholesome way to begin a discussion about the main questions, such as why are we here, who are we, what are we here for, what is the just city, how would it look like, what is the meaning of life. It's begun by a horrible lecture from a dictator. And you're then further told that if you do not bow the knee to a celestial dictatorship, unalterable, unchangeable, unappealable to, if you don't believe in that, you would have no means of telling right from wrong. How would you know how to do the right thing or avoid the wrong if you were not being told by a celestial dictatorship? Once again, an absolutely central attack on any concept that we might have of our own integrity, dignity, and self-respect. How would Huck Finn know? Admittedly, he's a fictional character, but then, so most of the people I'm going to be discussing, from Moses onwards. <clears throat> How does Huck Finn know that he's not to betray his friend Jim? He's not to give him back. He's not to give him up to the people who are hunting for him. How does Mark Twain know that we will like Huck when he refuses this? What does Huck know? The law is against him. The church is against him. All the preachments of religion and customary law are against him. He thinks that if he refuses the demand to give up his slave friend, he's going to go straight to hell. That's what he thinks, but he still does the right thing. As we might all hope to do, as we must all hope to do, if we were tested much less than that. It's innate in us. Religion gets its morals from us. We know what the right thing is without being told by a celestial dictatorship. If it were otherwise, this is why I say I'm an anti-theist, not an atheist. If it were otherwise, what would the situation be? every one of our waking and sleeping thoughts would be under permanent surveillance at all times from the moment of our conception, according to some at any rate, certainly birth, until not just when we died, because that's when the real fun would begin. <laughs> now, it's as if those who wish it to be true, which I do not, you can be an atheist and wish that there was a God, Many atheists I know do wish it was true. Why do I not? Because I don't want to live in a celestial North Korea. <clears throat> I'm one of the few people who's been to, uh, as a writer, to North Korea and Iran and Iraq too, to all the axis of evil countries in the last few years. In, when I was young and was told that this is what paradise will be like, you get to praise God all the time, forever, and continue thanking him for everything he's doing for you, sometimes with the aid of musical instruments. <laughs> but that's the thing, that's what paradise would be like, everlasting praise. I used to think, sounds like hell to me. <laughs> but I also wondered, what would it be like? I couldn't quite picture it. Um, an attempt is made in the movie Bedazzled, the first version, to try and convey how ghastly it would be. Well, now I know. I've been to a state where there's worship from dawn till dusk and thanking for everything you've got every tiny crumb, and there's what you get too is the tiny crumb. Nothing but thanks, nothing but praise. It's a state where, uh, not everybody knows this, Kim Jong-il is not the absolute dictator of North Korea. He's only the head of the party and of the North Korean army. The head of the state, the president, is his late father who's been dead for some 15 years, Kim Il-sung. He's still the president and he's the president, if you pardon the expression, for life, even though he's... <laughs> as it were, passed on, ceased to be, joined the choir in Visibule, <laughs> turned up his toes, he's an ex-president. Um, you could call it a necrocracy. Um, <clears throat> a thanatocracy, a mausolocracy. And it's also, you'll notice, just one short of a trinity, because the son is the reincarnation of the father. That's what it would be like if this horrible Bronze Age Palestinian myth was true. 